Bless also the gifts for the work of the deacons that they do in this church and community. And as we return a portion of the blessing that you have given us, may they show our love and trust in you, and may they be a blessing to those who receive them. And in a moment, we open your word to hear your message for us. We ask for a blessing on the reading, and we ask that you send your spirit. Soften our hearts, set us free from distraction, so that we might hear and understand what you want us to hear. Bless Pastor Mike as he shares a message that you placed on his heart. Thank you for the gifts and abilities that you've given to him and his willingness to use and share them with us. Continue to equip and encourage him in his work here. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights and plans that you have for us. Help us to live in ways that our lives will shine with the light of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of John, and we'll be reading John 14, verses 1 through 24. <clears throat> One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into the well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told him this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you might have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they, in, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell all those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered a servant go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Bill, for your prayer and for the scripture reading. Sometimes in the Gospels, we read and 
Do you ever wonder if this might have been one of those times where some of Jesus' family, who we hear mentioned other places in the Gospels, where some of his family may have been? His disciples were there, we're told, but maybe some of his family was there with him at this banquet. And I can't help but wonder if this is one of those times where his family thought to themselves, can't he just behave himself? Can he, can he just keep the comments to himself just once? We're told uh, that at the beginning of Luke chapter 14 that, that Jesus was at the home of a, of a prominent Pharisee. The, the language there gives the, gives the nuance that it, this person was a wealthy person, part of the ruling class of that community. As a Pharisee, he would be highly regarded in the religious community. And he was there for a Sabbath meal. There were distinguished guests, we're told, and it was at a table. And uh, the word here for table that, that Luke uses here in chapter 14, it indicates just that, that word table, it indicates that this is a, a large table that would, that would hold many guests. So this, this person has a, a home that's, that's large enough to accommodate a, a table uh, this kind of piece of furniture and this in the structure that would have had to been there to house a table and accommodate a large dinner party like this it wouldn't have been a a peasant meal there's a there are, were other tables the custom in the in the culture at that time and even now in many places in the middle east is to is to sit at low tables out and if there's a large group you the meal would be eaten outdoors but this is, this is inside at a, at a table where you would sit, not, not squat on the ground. And you'd, you wouldn't eat in the, in the custom of the peasantry. It's an it's a occasion where you, know, you need to know which fork to use for which course. This is, this is a high-class meal. And you probably have thought for a long time before about the topics of conversation that you'll engage with other people at the table uh, during the meal and who you might sit next to. But Jesus sits down. Jesus had been invited to this meal. He sits down and does his best, it seems, to offend the other guests and their sensibilities and their unspoken but clearly understood rules of behavior. He kind of uses their gathering, this gathering that around this table of these prominent guests, he uses their gathering as a counterexample of what the kingdom of God is like. And these are people who were not used to being used as a counterexample to what the kingdom of God was like. The, the passage that we read for the call to worship and the confession and assurance from Isaiah 25 may have been in the backs of the minds of a lot of these folks sitting around the table. The, certainly the host for this meal, this prominent Pharisee, would have known his Old Testament well. He would have known his scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 25 uh, we're told of a, of a banquet that is an image of the kingdom of God when God will rescue and redeem his people, when he will forgive their sins, when he will make every wrong right and set all things in their just and right relationship to one another. And Jesus, here at this banquet, he he notices their behavior and he uses it as a counterexample to what the kingdom of God should really be like. In verse 7 it says, He noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table and he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat, and then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. 
But when you are invited, he said, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Those who exalt themselves, he says, will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then he says, and when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite just your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite those who cannot repay you. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, he says, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. He says, in other words, he says, don't, don't do things the way you're doing things here right now. Don't, don't invite those who can pay you back. I, invite those who have no means to do so. He says, that's what the kingdom of God is like. And you can imagine the awkward silence around the table. Can't you? You can imagine the, the pause in conversation and people, you know, looking at the ceiling tiles. And then one of the guests tries to change the subject. When he heard this, we're told, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God tries to interject some piety into the conversation. After Jesus had used this banquet as an illustration of what the kingdom of God will not be like, it's just kind of awkward. Jesus doesn't seem to care about their sensibilities, their unspoken rules of behavior, their decorum. And so he, t he tells this parable of the great banquet. He says, a man was preparing a banquet. A prominent man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who'd been invited, come, for everything is now ready. What that tells us is that the as, as the text says, the people had already been invited. When, when a prominent citizen of a, of a community would give a banquet like this for many people, an invitation would go out well in advance, uh, you know, a, a save-the-date invitation, so to speak. And then when everything was ready, when the, when the animals had been slaughtered and prepared, when the food had been cooked, then the, the, in, in, the confirmation would come. Everything is ready. Come on, come to the table. Let's feast. Let's enjoy. Let's celebrate together. And that's the, the way the language is structured. Jesus says that what it literally says is continue coming. So these guests have committed themselves to come at the initial invitation. And he's confirming their attendance. It's so like an RSVP. And then the excuses begin to roll in. The first one says, Ah, oh, man, I just bought a field. I, I can't come. And another one says, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. Please excuse me. I had something come up. And then finally the third one says, oh, I've just gotten married. I mean, certainly that's, that's got to be an excuse, right? Well, not really. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best scholars who lived for many years and taught in, in the Middle East, a man by the name of Kenneth Bailey, knows the, the background, the cultural background of, of the parables in particular, but the the scriptures in general, but the parables in particularly, he made it his life study. And he says that these, these excuses, if you know that culture, 
I mean, to our ears, they may sound plausible. But if you know that culture, these excuses sound transparent. They, they're excuses made to, just because people don't really feel like, like doing it. Don't feel like attending this banquet, this great feast that's been prepared. When, when this first man says, I've, I've just purchased a field and I need to go see it. Well, if you've ever been to this area of the world, you know that, that tillable land, fertile land, is at a premium. You wouldn't purchase a field before you had thoroughly inspected the property. You, this, this would not be something that you would do after you'd already purchased a field. And, and to, to purchase five yoke of oxen and, and try them out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't purchase the oxen before trying them out. Now, I'm guessing none of us has ever, uh, in myself included, none of us has ever plowed with a, a team of oxen. Yes? No? Okay, good. So I, I'm taking this on, on Kenneth Bailey's word. So if you, if you plow with a team of oxen, you have to know that not only are, are the individual animals healthy, but that they also plow in tandem with each other, that they pull with equal, equal strength and, and, and walk at a, you know, at a similar pace, or else your, your rows aren't nice and straight. So to have purchased five yoke of oxen and not tried them out already, this just doesn't make, this doesn't add up in this culture. And to say, oh, I've just gotten married. Well, that's a lengthy process. And the date would have been known well in advance. There would have been a, a lengthy courtship and, and, you know, dates that would have had to pass and, and milestones that would have been celebrated along the way. This isn't something that just came up. And, and not only that, it, the time that a banquet would have, like this would have been given would have been in the evening. This is a, you know, before any electric lights, of course, and so people are dependent on, on natural light or maybe torches and candles. But this is not the time when you'd go try out a, a pair of oxen. You wouldn't go inspect a field as the sun was setting and expect to get much of a, an assessment of what the land was like. And so these, these excuses are really pretty transparent. These excuses that indicate that these people place status and wealth and relationships above this invitation to the banquet. And to excuse yourself, as I said at this point, it, this invitation had already been issued. This was just the confirmation. The invitation had been issued and accepted. And to excuse yourself at this point would be socially unacceptable because it would make you look like a clod, for one thing, and it would embarrass your host. And this is in an honor-shame culture where uh, a person's social reputation and social standing matters a great deal. And these transparent excuses are given. These aren't just things that would have come up unexpectedly. And to give an excuse like this would have been considered a clear affront to someone's honor and dignity. Even if they were legitimate excuses, to, to bail at the last minute just seems rude. It's as if you're saying, oh, I've just got better things to do, or I don't really feel like it, or what's on Netflix? And the host hears these excuses that his servant brings to him. And he, he channels his indignation first in a socially acceptable way by in inviting the needy of his own community. This would have been something that would have at least potentially enhanced his status. It was like a, even with the, 
the social affront that was given in this honor-shame culture by these people rejecting the people who had originally been invited by them rejecting the invitation at the last minute. This could be a way for for the the host of this banquet to, to recover some of his honor and maintain some of his standing in the community. This would have been something that a a prominent person like this host would have been expected to do, to to show generosity and, and kindness to people in his community. He says to his servant, he says, when... When he became angry, he ordered his servant, he says, go out into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. He says, do that. Invite the the people of the town. And the servant says, we've done that and there's still room. I mean, this must have been quite the place, quite the home, quite the banquet, quite the large table. There's still room. And so the host says to his servant, don't just go out into the town, into the people who I might be socially expected to show kindness and generosity to, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame of my own neighborhood and my own community but in an act that would have been a scandalous extension of regard toward those who would be deemed utterly unworthy of it. The host tells his servant, don't just go out into the town, into the streets and the alleyways. Go out into the roads and the country lanes. Go to the, to the hillbillies in the bumpkins of the community. Go out there. Go to those who don't even know there's a banquet happening yet. The, the, the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame in the community would have probably known about this event. It would have been a big deal. And they would have also known that they weren't the first ones invited. But the, the people that, that he's talking about now are those who probably didn't even know there was a banquet happening. These are the bumpkins, the hillbillies. He says, invite those people, the ones who would be deemed utterly unworthy of it. He invites the undeserving and the unaware, the ones who didn't even know there was a banquet in the first place. But you see, that's the whole point, isn't it? If grace is grace, then by definition, we've done nothing to deserve it. We might not even be aware that it exists or that we even need it. But God wants a full house for the feast of celebration of his abundant love and generosity. That word table there in verse 15, as I said, it indicates a a table that you sit at, not one that you sit on the ground for, not a low table. And it it indicates someone of, of wealth and status. You know the only other times that this word is used in the gospel of Luke one is in chapter 22 when Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples just before he goes to his trial and the cross and experiences his death And the other time is with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And of course, those two 
instances at the Passover and the Emmaus meal. Those are clear references to the sacrament, to the Lord's Supper. Jesus is saying simply by the presence of that word that Luke has chosen, he's saying the table, the great banquet, includes all those who, who can't possibly repay the goodness and the love and the generosity that they experience here. That when they gather at this table, it's connected to that table that Jesus sat at with his disciples at the Passover. That table where he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread on the Emmaus Road. He invites us to this table. A feast of his generous abundance, of his gracious love for us. A feast that tells us that he gave his very self for us. Not just the feast that Isaiah talks about in, in chapter 25, a feast of aged wine, a feast of finest meats. This is a feast of his own body and blood that tell us how much he loved us. And none of us can ever repay that. We've done nothing to deserve it. Maybe we're not even always aware that it exists or that we need it, like those last people invited, the, the people from the country lanes and the, the roads the people out in the wilderness. But God wants a full house, a full table for this feast of celebration of his love and generosity. So come. Come receive his grace. Come celebrate the feast and enjoy the generosity and the abundance of that is offered here to all the undeserving. Because this meal says at least as much about God as it does about us, of our need for grace and God's desire to give to all who come. So come without anything to offer, without your excuses, but only your need and his invitation to his table. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you invite us here. That you invite all those who cannot repay you, who have only need to offer. And we rejoice that you are a God who in our need offers abundance, generosity, grace, and love so undeserved. And yet, you desire to give it to us. May we be surprised by the invitation you offer and overjoyed so that we come with empty hands waiting to be filled with hearts that overflow with your love so that we with all your servants might be those who are called to go and invite others to experience your grace in abundance and generosity, to go to the crippled and the poor and the blind and the lame, to go to the 
those who are undeserving and unaware and share with them this good news of your desire to celebrate the fullness of your love with a full house, a table of welcome, unworthy, and joyful guests. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.